Great. So welcome, everyone. I'm Sarah Ling from the Chinese Canadian Museum, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Jackie and I are tuning in from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And Ryan is on the island. Uh, yeah, I'm on Pender you know Island. That <laughs> Pender Island. That's where I'm calling it from. Okay. Yes. But we'll invite all of you to reflect on the host nations of the territories you are on, um, if that applies to where you are tuning in from. It's great to see such a diverse audience through the chat box, anywhere from the island to Toronto to Jersey Shore to England. So that's quite exciting. <laughs> so today we're very uh, excited to speak with Jackie Kai Ellis and Ryan Ma for this afternoon's program, Happiness, Wealth, Prosperity, Chinese Canadian Food Culture and Traditions. Uh, so we're going to have a really interesting conversation about Lunar New Year foods and customs. Um, as many of you may know, tomorrow marks the day of the Lantern Festival. So it will officially mark the end of the two week Lunar New Year celebration. So I thought I would start off by asking Jackie and Ryan how you celebrated this year. Jack, do you want to kick it off? <laughs> you want to kick it off? Okay, I'll kick All it right. off. All right, sure. Um, this year, we were actually, I had a work trip in Toronto. So unfortunately, we were not with family. But my parents actually also went on a trip to Antarctica. So we didn't celebrate together. But we did do some pre-celebrations, classic, because um, our family's huge. My mom had eight brothers and sisters. Uh, and all of them have uh, children and it's yeah some of them flew in from Hong Kong so it, we we had maybe four tables at a Chinese restaurant and um, and celebrated that way with the classic red red pockets and you know roast pig and you have to eat fish and yeah so we did all of that how about you guys? yeah that sounds pretty much the same I mean it's 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 kind of funny the the things that lead up to Chinese New Year, right? Like my mom is like, gotta get your hair cut, gotta clean the house. Uh, what other things? She'd give me these like, I don't know if you do this, Jackie. She'd give me these like little oranges with a leaf, and she'd make mm -hmm. me put on a plate. And you put a couple of those around the house, <clears throat> the little lucky money. So we do that. And uh, I've got a five year old, so he was going around collecting, you know, lucky money um yeah and a, and a dinner to, to celebrate it so yeah it was fun it was good wonderful um well here in Vancouver the annual spring festival parade uh was in full force so it was really an electric feeling to be in Chinatown uh the Chinese Canadian Museum for us as a new organization it was our first time marching so we had prepared about 8,000 custom fortune cookies and we got we gave them all away within the first um, half of the of the parade, so that was a lesson in learning how to pace ourselves next year. <laughs> but not enough fortune cookies this time. That's a lot never, of fortune cookies. Never wow. enough fortune cookies. That's what were the fortunes? Popular. What were the fortunes um, inside? <clears throat> well, we were given a character limit, so we couldn't be super creative. It's almost like Twitter, where you can't. <laughs> Say as much as we want. <laughs> and we want it to be inclusive. So we wanted it in English and traditional Chinese. <laughs> so some common, you know, wishes of prosperity or um, giving people some excitement that we're opening in July. So it's like in July, you will visit the Wing Sang building. <laughs> that's a good one. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a preview to our grand opening. But it was interesting. A lot of adults wanted the fortune cookies, not only the little kids in the crowd. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But it was I really mean, nice so to nostalgic. see, you know, the street so vibrant and people really come out to support our community and and uh, and annual traditions again. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And I know in Victoria, we also have a site there. They actually did it uh, last weekend and it was quite quite active in Victoria. Cool. Yeah, so I know awesome. many people, especially in this crowd, celebrated by watching the host special series. 
Did awesome. you really? <laughs> Ooh, good one. <laughs> Thank you for I did. watching. I didn't watch it all yeah. in one go, but yeah. I did watch this episode in preparation for today. It was terrific. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Just loved it. <laughs> so Thanks nice. So thank you. So my first question, just to get the conversation rolling, is what inspired you to, to really create this series, Ryan, with your team? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I think uh, about four years ago, I had worked on a Indigenous food and travel show where we took Indigenous chefs from like across Canada. We visited different communities within BC and Alberta. And at the time, I think it was really a, a unique show about just, um, you know, food and culture and, and, and these chefs visiting these different communities. And then once we finished that show, I started thinking, you know, I haven't seen a, you know, what was the Chinese Canadian version of this, you know, and I had, I'd never seen it on, on, on TV or a program about it. And so that kind of just got our team thinking like, okay, maybe we should, we should pitch something like this. And uh, we had a really good relationship with Talis and like, Hey, you know, maybe there's something there. And this is kind of maybe about a year after um, Anne Huey put out her book. Um, uh, oh, the name of the book slipped my mind. Chop Suey Nation. Chop Suey Nation. Thank you. Chop Suey Nation. So I was like, okay, there's something here. And so that's where we pitched it. And then, you know, ultimately it ended up like, you know, it's like, who's going to host this? You know, we were looking for the right person to, to, you know, visit these small towns to tell the story. And I had worked with Jackie a little bit. And this is not very long after you launched the book, maybe within a year or two, Jackie, your book. Uh, book was 2018. Yeah. 2018. Okay. So a little bit, so yeah. within like three years. And uh, so as we were looking for a host, I, you know, Jackie thankfully had an audio version of this book. So I could be just quick, listen to it. And we're like, you know, Jackie, I think is the right person to host this because she's just so good at recollecting, you know, memories or little stories about, you know, making dumplings with grandma. And I was like, okay, I think this is the person that's going to pull us through the story and this journey. And we pitched it and, and, uh, and tell us like, this is great. Like we got to do this. So that's kind of, that's kind of how it all happened. And Jackie, I must admit, I don't think I knew about your book. Do you want to share a little bit about it? Yeah. So it was, uh, it's, it's a memoir called the measure of my powers. Uh, and I think the subtitle, I, I always get them mixed up. I don't know why. The subtitle was A Memoir of Food Misery in Paris. And it was a bestseller when it came out. Well, I guess it still is because once you're a bestseller, you're, I, it never goes <laughs> away. Sure. Yeah. So it's a bestselling, uh, a bestselling book. Also Heather's pick at Indigo. And it really is just uh, about a very raw and vulnerable retelling of uh, sort of the most difficult moments in my life, uh, going through depression and uh, sort of finding myself and and yeah, trying to trying to grasp um, mm. a life that was my own. So yeah, that's mm. that's what that book is about. I think too the other thing about your book, you know, as I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of away, but you'd close your shop at that point, right? And you kind yes. of like. Mm. And so I think too, that was another kind of thing where like, you know, um, we kind of used a bit of Jackie's memoir and kind of weaved it into the show. She could go back and talk about things that happened. And so that was another, another really, right. the fact that she wrote that um, was really helpful in, in producing the show. Yeah. And I have to say writing the show was one of my favorite parts. Um of the process I, I I mean obviously you know shooting with you all and being on location and talking to people and discovering some new stories that was all really fun but I think it was so unexpected that writing the show was so gratifying to me because it felt like like we could take all of these moments and somehow connect them back and make them matter from a heart perspective mm -hmm. um and it it really felt like all these pieces really came together to create some, some, at least for me, some powerful moments. I know at the, at the screening, the launch, one of my friends who's a cinematographer was like, 
man, I think, I think you broke the seal. Like I actually cried. <laughs> I was like, what? Really? Anyway. Yeah. I was quite proud of that. Yeah. That I That's awesome. Broke the seal. Yeah. So Jackie, as a writer of this show, you come up, you came across some really, you know, generous and touching people in these different cities. Um, and I know yourself, you, you share a lot of personal stories through the episodes, but I wonder, um, you know, having gone through this journey and having encountered so many interesting characters and places, what, what types of teachings have you walked away with um, from having gone through this experience? Yeah, for me, I, I know I've shared this before, but it, it's still really powerful in my mind. You know, you you learn a little bit about the history of Chinese Canadians, but I don't think I knew even a fraction of what actually happened and what the history really was. I think that, you know, you learn a lot of history in high school, uh, but a lot of it's omitted. And there's actually no way, even from a textbook, even if someone tried to do it justice, that you could even begin to relate well, at least I couldn't begin to relate as a teenager to what the personal struggles were. And I think when we were in, I think it was Kelowna, we were at a museum where they had some letters uh, that were preserved and written from China to some of the uh, some of the young men that came here to work, uh, whether it be you know just as laborers or um, restaurant workers or or whatever it was, and. I think the letter said something along the lines of, uh, please send more money. We want to give your, your father a respectful burial. Hopefully one day um, your grandchildren may be able to prosper. And then it really hit me. Okay, this young man has left his home, probably with the knowledge that he'll never see his wife ever again. He'll never see his parents or his family ever again. He's working in an environment where there's no normal, uh, there's no sense of comfort because it were, there were only men allowed to come over really because it was financially prohibitive because of the head tax. So they're living in these lums with only other men and they're sending money home, not for the benefit of the immediate family, but for people, his grandchildren, whom he will never meet. And I was like, that is the epitome of sacrifice. And it made me understand why Chinese love is the way it is. Why we feed each other, why we're so practical in our love and why my, giving money is such a important thing because we have so many generations and such a history of that kind of sacrifice being our language of love so that was very yeah it was very impactful to me it helped me to understand my own relationships with my family a lot better thank you for sharing that really resonates and speaking of your experience i'm going to pull up a clip from the episode and feel free to drop a comment if you watched the show and, and what your thoughts are about it. Um, but we're going to pull up at least two of my favorite scenes in episode five. And the first one is about the ham yu dish. So Jackie, you might want to share a little bit about, you know, why we eat fish during this time of the year. But it was just fascinating to see the restaurant owner go ice fishing and then hear about how he actually salts his own fish. It's like quite an extraordinary process to do to do from scratch. Yeah, I, I love also that he learned how to do this from his mom. It wasn't something as the chef he learned to do. It was like a passed down recipe because he probably grew up, you know, in a, in a like coastal town where you would salt the fish because, you know, there's just so much of it. Um, uh, so I guess fish and Chinese New Year, there are homonyms uh, in 
at least in Cantonese where I, I speak, I'm assuming it's the same in Mandarin. Uh, so it's uh, yu, which is fish, and yu, which means uh, kind of like prosperity. Um, and so in, in Chinese traditions for uh, Chinese New Year, you often will eat a lot of these homonyms or foods that look like uh, things of prosperity, like dumplings uh, because they look like gold ingots or uh, oranges because uh, gum is like, or mandarin oranges, gum is also gold. Uh, so that's sort of why there are all these, these dishes that you just have to eat to bring, to bring prosperity, wealth, good luck and opportunity to yourself and help. Thank you. It's a great reminder for me, like we grow up being fed all of these wonderful foods, but sometimes don't even realize the the layers of care and meaning that go into preparing that kind of um, New Year's feast. So without further ado, I will pull up that first clip. And nod your head, uh, Ryan Jackie, if the sound comes through okay. <laughs> You can see the picture. Okay, great. Not to mention holds the affinity for a good play on words. That's why many auspicious Chinese words have an accompanying food with a similarly sounding name that must be eaten during Chinese New Year. In this case, to I don't think I can I don't see the picture. Yeah. It's not. Oh, let's see. Not it's, the not, picture. It's, it's not playing. It's not playing. I hear the audio, but it's not playing for whatever yeah. reason. Let me see. Let's try that again. Okay, I see a new picture here. Maybe yeah. take it back. Okay, now uh, this might work here. Here, let's try yeah. that. Okay. There we go. For yeah. a good play on words. That's why many auspicious Chinese words have an accompanying food with a similarly sounding name that must be eaten during Chinese New Year. In this case, to attract yu or surplus, one must eat yu or fish. We've come to Wally's to make home you guy love tau fun, salted fish and chicken from his rice. It's a simple dish, usually with ribbons of iceberg lettuce strung through the rice, scrambled egg, and little bits of pungent salted fish, like anchovies, lending its intense umami in every bite. Instead, this time we're using Jeremy's freshly caught fish to make a homemade hang yu salted fish. So what's the process? Do you uh, we have to put in the sauce for four or five days. Where did you learn how to do this? Oh, we, uh, from my mother, you know. The salted fish and fried rice is a very common dish that you would order at a restaurant. I've grown up eating it. I love it. He catches the fish himself, then salts them, uses that salted fish. I've never had it like that before. It's almost like putting anchovies in them. Yes, yeah. It's not the main food. It's not how to say the main dish. Yeah, yeah. Like really much uh, like flavor. It's just a flavoring. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We can't cook Chinese street like this at home because there's no way that your your wok at home will ever get so hot to the point where it's actually burning red. Normally I've seen it like the hot yu is really small. Yeah. Yeah. But you're making like really big hang yu. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna try to get some hang yu in there too. Okay, let's see. Mmm. Wow, that's good. It's so good. Like it's really salty, but like good salty. But you can also taste all the freshness of the fish. That's really good. Yeah, that's very good. Okay, I also just want to show folks a few seconds of the fishing process. Sure. <laughs> I'm sure that was a once in a lifetime for for all of you. It was cold. It was cold. <laughs> yeah, it was really cold. Curious to see how hard it was. In my mind, it was like you put the thing on and it just goes zzz, zzz, and then all of a sudden it's done. But actually, it takes quite a bit of force. How many months pregnant are you, Jackie, doing this? I think I was seven months pregnant. 
on a frozen lake. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. He likes the simple things. What do you think is the best part? If it's not catching a fish. I can focus to in here, my mic here. Yeah. No business. No work. No problems. Yeah. Sometimes the whole lake cut by myself. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Does it bring back memories? Yeah, it does. Yeah. It was it was uh <laughs> seriously cold. It was like minus 33, I think, out there. Yeah, it was yeah. it was cold, but I was so grateful that you were all so protective of me <laughs> in my in my very pregnant state that you all endured the cold and that the last you minute you say, okay, come out of come out of the van and go into this little fish hut and so I never really felt that cold and yeah. I was wearing um thermal leggings under a knit dress I don't know why I decided I was going to wear a dress that day I think I didn't fully realize that we were going ice fishing I don't I had a big park on but mm -hmm. yeah but I never felt cold and some people are like you're wearing a dress and it's minus 40 or whatever it was yeah, but you guys really did protect me a lot, and I was yeah. so grateful for it. Yeah, yeah, no, it was fun. So Ryan, in scripting these episodes, like, did you imagine you would be, you know, going out on the land and doing this kind of thing, or was it a, a surprise along the way? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, I mean, you know, I and I give credit to our producers Joanna and Priyanka, but you know, we're visiting a lot of. Um, small ch Chinese restaurants in, in different towns. And, and the story is, is very similar between all of them, right? It's like we have immigrants that are sacrificing everything to open a Chinese restaurant, but we're looking for like the really unique stories. And in Grand Prairie, we just happened to come across that gentleman who ran that, uh, that uh, restaurant. And I think Joanna asked him, you know, what's your specialty? You know, what do you like to cook off menu? And he's like, oh, well, I go ice fishing for my own salted fish. And I'm like, wow, okay, I've never heard that. We need to, we need to um, meet with you. And uh, yeah, that was literally, I think, the first scene in Grand Prairie. We like literally got off the plane, got wow. into a truck, went straight to the lake, <laughs> trying to find, trying to find this guy's middle, middle of nowhere. And um, I remember Jackie. We, I don't know if we made it into the cut, but you know, you're like. Uh, the guy was telling us, uh, oh no, sorry, Jackie was saying, uh, you know, is this safe to drive on this lake? And he's and he was like, you have to follow the tracks, you have to follow someone else's tracks while they drive because you know at least that's that path is safe. Anything else, but maybe not, <laughs> right, Jackie? Yeah. And then he was like, uh, we all buckled up, and he's like, no, 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 don't put your seatbelts on because if we go down, yeah. you don't want anything holding you underwater. Yeah. We're like, okay. Yes. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, Got yeah, it. You're yeah. already on the water, so there's no yeah. turning back. You can't be like, I want to go back because you'll still have to go back over the water. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So but and, and, and even just totally <laughs> worth it. But it was even cool to see. I've never seen Hami uh fun, like you know, big chunks like that back in the kitchen. That was really cool to see. So we thought that was definitely a unique. A unique character that we wanted to uh interview it actually yeah. reminds me of i've been to some of the villages in in guangdong where my mom's from she's from toisan mm. and that, that it reminds me a lot of what they do you know in the villages they dry the fish dry the vegetables and then prepare the meal quite fresh from literally you know a few inches away <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely not something you see very often like in you know, downtown Vancouver, people aren't making their own. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So another interesting character you met, um, mm -hmm. was it Joe? Yeah. Yeah. You want me to just oh, give, yeah. give the intro to Joe? Sure. Uh, so we were, as we were looking for uh, characters in Grand Prairie for the Chinese New Year episode, um, we wanted someone to to make like a traditional New Year's feast for us, and we found this gentleman named Joe. And uh, if the name of the restaurant just slips my mind, it'll say in the video. But his claim to fame was that he brought the cream cheese wonton to Canada, which is a big claim to fame. And I'm yeah, I don't know how he measured this, but he 
he has a crazy story and we couldn't fit it in the cut but he somehow jackie do you want to you talk to him i can't it's insane how do you so he i can't even remember exactly how it all started but somehow well, I mean, boat. he recorded it. He recorded it on camera. So I don't think he would be upset if we shared it because it was no. it was yeah, up yeah, for yeah. grabs, right? So I think he was having money problems because he had like a gambling issue. And <laughs> <laughs> and then he was somehow it was like a stowaway on a boat or something yeah, like right, that. Right. Um, but then ended up working on the boat and then just one day decided that he didn't want to be on the boat anymore so he just said then i just jumped and i was yeah. like so you you just jumped in the middle of the ocean like what I, yeah. and he goes no i just got off the boat when it when it Do docked somewhere docked yeah and i was so, like oh yeah. i just imagined him jumping off the boat and being like oh, i don't want to do this anymore yeah. just jumping and swimming to shore somewhere Anyway, no, it wasn't that fancy, but he ended up working in all these different places in in the United States. Ended up working at a Chinese restaurant in Vegas, I think it was. Mm. Learned this uh, cream cheese wonton, mm. which basically tastes like uh, like cheesecake inside of a crispy wonton shell, deep fried cheesecake. Uh, and then was like, this is something. So then he <laughs> eventually found his way up to grand prairie and yeah i was like this is going to be my this, this is, is going to be my thing so yeah. he since he makes zillions of these things and he every order he basically sends a couple and people are just hooked on it and i think i'll be i'll be honest with you i was like oh i don't know it's a cream cheese wonton how good can it be and we're just you don't see us but we're just like pounding these things back as we're filming so good so good so uh yeah yeah if you want to, if you want to uh, oh, zip into a I clip think we there, should, yeah, watch it. Sure. It's looking. There's a few people sharing their memories of Hamu dishes. Oh, nice. Oh, I'm gonna go back. Well, let me just pull up the wonton clip. Hmm. Can you see the picture? Mm, it uh, just says just has started sharing. Oh, hang on. It's doing something. So, okay, here we go. Yeah. Maybe yeah play. Okay. Great. Let's try it. I think it's right here. Okay, let's recap. We now know that Grand Ferry has minus 40 degree weather. We know it's the place if you're looking for a great job. But I bet you didn't know that Grand Prairie is also the home to the cream cheese wonton. What is that, you ask? I asked myself the exact same question. When you first tasted a cream cheese wonton, what did you think? It's popular. So you're like, this is... I like it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Customer, like it. So how long have you been making this recipe for? Since 2000. We opened a so restaurant. 22 years? Yeah. So how do you do this? Yeah, okay. 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 Like this. Yeah. 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 See my card. You have like all the gods and the Chinese. Oh, Oh, it looks like flowers. Yeah. Okay, you do. It's like cheesecake. Really yeah, but you get the texture from the wonton skin. Oh. And the inside is like gooey and hot. <laughs> it's like eating like um a, a cheesecake popper. 
Everyone comes for the cream cheese wontons, but today, Joe's making something special just for us. Let's talk about Chinese New Year. What's on? Okay, that's a teaser for <laughs> the special <laughs> dish Jackie got to eat. <laughs> oh man, I want some now. <laughs> Those are pretty. Yeah. Have you, have you tried making them since, Jackie? I I have not. I have not tried making them. Uh, and I haven't even tried making uh, ham yu, any ham yu dishes because, I mean, I'm a little bit ashamed, but like totally not ashamed at the same time that my mother-in-law cooks for me all the time. And so she drops off food three times a week and too much that we can actually eat every, like in three days. So there's always so much Chinese food in the fridge that I never have to cook, which is Lucky. exactly what moms are for, right? <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> well, there's a lot of chatter going on. What a mom loves awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And she knows exactly what dishes I like most and yeah. always makes that because one of my favorite vegetables is eggplant and she there's always an eggplant dish she even I know this is going to make me sound so spoiled she even makes the white rice like we don't even need to make the white rice for ourselves she makes the rice for us which is yeah. I feel like I just I mean we're so spoiled yeah uh it's funny I think we had this conversation Jackie where it's like at home you've got like the garbage can the recycling bin and then like the basket where all the uh, containers that mom made food for, they all go in there so you can give them back to her to make more food. Yeah. Yeah. We <laughs> yeah. have like rotating bags, like all yeah. the Tupperware and yeah. the bag Tupperware. and we give it back to her. And she just basically exchanges it <laughs> yeah. with the other bag. And I, it's like this covert operation, like, okay, and, you know, it's yeah. like a drug, a drug <laughs> deal or something. Yeah, exactly. I think others can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Eventually I'll, I'll start cooking again. I'm j I think this is like carryover from, from having a baby that she's just, I mean, the nicest woman in the world. She just really wants to be helpful and to make sure that we're well-fed. Cause at first I was like, is it because I'm not feeding my husband? Like, is that my <laughs> job now? I have no idea. I haven't been married for that long, but am I supposed to be feeding him? But no, it's just because she loves to cook and she loves to love us through food as a Chinese yeah. mom does. And and my mom, which I found out only this past year, she actually hates to cook. I had no idea because she was always cooking for us because she loves us so much. She would just do something she hated doing because oh, wow. this is the way you love. She's like, I have to tell you, I hate it. So I'm so glad that your mother-in-law is cooking for you because now I don't have to do it. <laughs> That's awesome. But yes, definitely an expression of love. You can see a lot of our audience can can speak to that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this cream cheese the... wonton, I feel like there's a growing list of like Chinese Canadians who claim to have created something in Canada. Mm. So in Edmonton, I heard it's where the original green onion pancake, pancake came from. Although mm -hmm. I wonder how true that is because I haven't heard that one. I'm I'm gonna say probably not because <laughs> that's a northern Chinese dish that could be know, a debate. Yeah, yeah, my family's been making for many. Maybe many there's something that makes it unique there. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe they put something special in it. Yeah. So I, where I was born, although the restaurant shut down, apparently they would make chow mein buns, which isn't like super creative, but chow mein in a bun, people liked it. Yeah, Prince Rupert. Mm hmm. It's a thing. So are there other, you know, fusion dishes like this that you've come across? Or what is your take on, you know, how chefs have really come to Canada and have been able to adapt and really speak to the local community that they've become, you know, a central part of? I mean, I think ginger beef is a classic example of that because in Calgary, the the prized meat is beef and they they have I, I don't remember where in China they were originally from but they said that you know there was this sort of 
like meat snack where they were from. They thought, okay, let's make this. And originally it was only supposed to be a bar snack because people were drinking late at night and they just wanted someone, something for them to chew. Like just my mouth is watering just thinking about <laughs> you right now. This is so embarrassing. I'm like having to like swallow. Um, so yeah, I mean, and basically they created for, for local palates. It uh, originally wasn't in sticks as ginger beef is. Uh, they they made it into sticks because they thought, oh, well, the local people love French fries. So we might as well make them into French fry shapes. So I feel like that is the classic, you know, make something for your audience, make something new for your audience dish. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I mean, that was like probably the highlight of the whole series was the Silver Inn <clears throat> in Calgary, but it closed yeah. uh, this no. past fall, which is such a shame. And uh, I think everyone keeps asking us, where should we go? Where should we go on your list? And I was like, that would have been the place to go. It was, yeah. uh, it was incredible. Did they closed due to retirement or COVID? I think so. I think the family, they were just, it, it was just run by so many generations of family. It was just like, you know, just, that was it. That was it. And we were lucky. We were probably, we filmed there maybe three months before it closed too. So we just got, you know, wow. it was nice to have, have that on camera. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think you touch upon that in your series too, that struggle of like the parents don't necessarily want to burden the next generation. Yeah. In one of your other episodes, I can't remember their names, the two sisters that, you know, took yeah. on business because of mm. their own passion was quite touching to see. Yeah, it's a common theme. I mean, a lot of, I mean, I think a lot of, there are a lot of restaurant owners that just like, I don't want my kids to go through this. This is not glamorous by any means. You know, we, we did this to, as a, as a, means to provide for our family you know and it's hard work and hours are crazy and and it was interesting to film there's another episode where we filmed in vernon where we had one family was like um the kids took on the business and they're like that's it we don't want to do this anymore we need to stop hit the brakes and now enjoy whatever time we have left with you know our mom and dad because there's some of these chinese restaurant owners they're working until like their 80s and so, you know, and then the flip side, we've also filmed other um, Chinese restaurant owners where, you know, the kids took it on. They're like, no, we want to, we want to take this business on. You know, we're, we're so fortunate to, that they gave us this foundation up for us to start a Chinese restaurant and we want to expand, you know, and, and make it bigger. So it was really interesting to see both sides of the story for sure. Yeah. It reminds me of, there's a frozen dim sum restaurant here in Chinatown. I won't name it. So there's no favoritism, but to see the younger generation take it over and really yeah. decide their own career is, is quite, quite amazing. And, and yeah. the community really, you know, has come out to support them. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So I think this last portion will ask anyone who is comfortable to turn on their camera and you have an opportunity to ask your own question to Jackie and or Ryan. Yeah, let's hear it. Yeah, ask us anything. And you can use the chat box as well if you're more shy. That's totally fine. Is there anything you want to share before we start the Q&A? What was your favorite memory from that entire experience? Favorite memory of the entire experience. Jeez. Um, that's such a blur. It also feels like it was a long time ago, uh, but it wasn't. Uh, what was the period favorite? you actually shot the series? Uh, we shot it. Uh, oh, okay. I have a memory. Yeah. Uh, so we shot it last last year, right? It was last year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, pregnant, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Obviously your kid's less than not a year old. So it was like last September to, um, February. It was like a four or five month window. Right. Um, but I think, yeah, just a real quick memory, um, was our, uh, second We we were filming in, um, uh, Vernon and, uh, it was a pint oh god a jackie what's like it was the, it was first so taking was first so it was Kelowna and vernon yeah and it was the day it was it was we were getting ready we're all in the van and it's like six in the morning and the, the rain is crazy it's raining like nuts 
and um, and it was the day I don't know if everyone remembered where the the floods washed out the highways. But this is literally three like hours before it happens. We're ready to go. Jack's in the car. I'm like, okay, here we go. Floods washed out one of the highways. No one knew how bad it was, but Google's like, don't go this way. Go this other way. Go up north. And we were driving up north. So we've got Jackie, who's pregnant mom, and we've got whole crew, and we're driving in. I can't remember which part of the highway we were on, but there were boulders, huge boulders sprinkled all over the highway. So we were just driving like 20 around these boulders. We had no idea how bad it was. And there's one section of the highway we were driving and the, and um, uh, we got to, I don't know if we were at Cash Creek. I can't remember which small town we stopped. And 45 minutes later, the whole like landslide washed away. And we were stuck. We were, like, there was no back coming back to Vancouver. So we had to go forward. We did all our filming there and uh, the roads weren't open. There was no way to Vancouver. So we had to fly, fly back, leave all our gear in, in Cologne and Vernon. That was a harrowing moment. <laughs> yeah. I, we had no idea what we had gotten ourselves into. No, no. And also we were trying to do cooking segments in Kelowna and there was, because none of the trucks could go through, none of the food was getting through. It was so hard to find green onions. onions. <laughs> Yes, yeah, right. and find ingredients to do these cooking demos. So yeah. we had to change some of the food that we were going to cook right. based off of that. what we could. And we had to barter with local restaurants to be like, can we have one green onion? <laughs> yeah, I forgot one. about that. Yeah, you know, whatever you got in your fridge, I'll take it. Yeah, I yeah. forgot about that. Or you guys would come to me and be like, so you say in the recipe you need five green onions, but can <laughs> you like really do two? <laughs> yeah. I actually noticed that. Is that why sometimes you're like... Normally, I would use a peach, but I'm going to use an apricot. Yeah, I can't remember what it was. It was, yeah, I was just make the best. Yeah, but, yeah. but it was, it was, you know what? It was all those memories that made, you know, when looking back, it, you're right. That is a good memory. Yeah. Also, we stopped roadside and had uh, hot dogs at a roadside. <laughs> Whatever it was. Yeah. And I was so pregnant and not supposed to be eating hot dogs, but I was craving a hot dog so badly. Yeah. So yeah, it was yeah. one of one one of my favorite moments was eating a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Sometimes you need a hot dog. <laughs> you do. All right, we have a few questions. Okay, here we go. First one is from Stanley in sure. Malaysia. Thanks for sharing so much. Which dish did you enjoy the most and which episode is your favorite? Go for I, it, liked ginger, I liked ginger beef the best. I f yeah. apart from like the soups that some of the some of the moms made me, um, I think as a restaurant dish, the ginger beef was revelatory. It was so different and so much more elegant than I kind of expected it to be. I expected, you know, sort of like a sweet and sour pork version of beef, but it was actually very light and crispy and well-balanced and all of that. Um, in terms of my favorite episode, I think episode number two, which is uh, Food is Love, that one it, to me is my favorite because, you know, it talks about moms and how moms love us through food and how we as a culture don't say hi how are you we say hi have you eaten yet mm -hmm. and it's just about that yeah that connection to how we love each other and and then me thinking about on the precipice of being a mother for the first time and how does that change the way I love my child knowing having gone drilled into this sort of like language and history of, of food so yeah I think that was my favorite what about you Ryan uh ginger beef for sure yeah that was that was definitely um <clears throat> just it's so unassuming when you look at it right Jackie was just like wow uh yeah. that was definitely my favorite and my favorite episode uh I think the uh, you know, funnily enough, I think one of the favorite episodes I have uh, is that this is the last one is the Grand Prairie one. It's just because I edited it. So, and I knew it was a state where, you know, we were during the post side, we had to kind of slam all these scenes together. And in that one, we had to, uh, I, was, I worked day and night to put that thing together. And I'm really happy uh, the way it turned out. So that definitely for me is uh, is one of my favorites. Yeah. And like, thanks for I feel like you guys shielded me from so much stress too. <laughs> you know, it's 
And I hear what, well, yeah, I worked day and night to edit that. And it just came. And then all of a sudden there's this beautiful video <laughs> at the end of it. And I was like, wow, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like I had no <laughs> clue how yeah, yeah, yeah. much and hard and just the amount of effort and, and coordination yeah. that it takes to actually put something like this together. It, it blows my mind because I actually don't even know a fraction of what happened. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I'll give you a little insight. I mean, we were because they're just the way the deadlines were. I think the Grand Prairie episode, I put that together. There's different types of cuts and stages. You have a rough cut, your fine cut, and then your picture lock where you can't touch anything. I think the last stage, I think I literally, I worked for far, four hours. I'd sleep for 20 minutes, work for four hours, sleep for 20 minutes. I did that for a week. Every day, just four hours, 20 minutes, four hours, 20 minutes. I had to just go, go, go. Because we had to deliver. And it was just like, it was in a really rough shape when we first got it. And we're like, well, I've got to crank this. So that's for me, that was my favorite one. Because I just, that's very I, just intensive. I slept through that. It just I just had to get this thing done. So yeah. <laughs> I had no clue. Yeah. And you, I'd be like, hey, how's it going? Good, good, good. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, okay. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> And you always yeah. made time. You always yeah. made time. Like I had no clue you were sleeping in 20 <laughs> minute intervals. Jokes, yeah. You always made time for me just to be like, hey. Yeah, what's going on? Shit yeah, today, yeah. what's going on? And you're like, yeah, yeah. hey. Totally, <laughs> totally, totally. Wow. So well, cool. you you and your team did a masterful job. And Thank you. Win in the chat box. Yeah, what else we got here? wants to compliment Jackie because you had a lovely warm presence hosting and and the real writing really comes through and someone has asked about the demos that you do at the end is there a link to the recipes or do people need to go to the youtube channel to find them uh there is you the the recipes are within the, if you go to the youtube and you scroll the, the recipes at the very end i'm pretty sure it's there yeah, you, you need can to find watch the show to get the recipe. <laughs> you do, you do. You can't just download it. <laughs> yeah. What else After we got you here? Decide which cities to go to, and then the related question is: Did and Hui's book guide you at all? Oh, good question. Yeah, um, I can jump into that. Uh, in terms of cities, and did Chop Suey Nation guide our journey? We decided to stick through BC and Alberta because. Um, the original uh, and Huey goes across the country and it's just because of the story of like you know the railways you know started it uh with with the Chinese coming to you know the Pacific Northwest and so we started there and if there's another season we'll, we'll continue on um but uh and in terms of cities I mean really it started with themes actually we we thought of like okay what are the themes that we want to talk about for, you know in regards to Chinese the Chinese Canadian story and so we had like for example, food is love was one of the themes and um, hard work was another theme and um, oh God, other themes kind of slipped my mind here, but we started with those and then we just, you know, our producers kind of did a skim of like interesting stories, kind of clumped the stories, what would fit under each kind of theme. And that's kind of how we picked the cities, you know, the strongest stories that would tell. That's kind of how it happened. But um, yeah, actually, you know, I don't think we actually visited, uh, funny enough, the, the spots that and who we went to, we just kind of started okay. from scratch. Yeah. Well, and what I like about it is because there isn't much overlap, you really highlight places that people don't normally think about. Mm, yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Coming from a rural place myself, it's much appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what else we got here? Uh, right, there's a I lot pasted of... a question that was yeah Just sure to me but I think okay it's you. sure in the second episode when did you feel in your food journey and life that food is an expression is a love expression and what triggered that realization I think that's to Jackie yeah I mean it's uh it's not that I only realized it during this journey of of doing this show I think you always know it growing up when your mom cuts you a plate of fruit and says, eat your papaya. It's like her saying, Hey man, I love you so much. Come give me a kiss and a hug, which like never happened <laughs> as a kid. Right. But so, you know, this, but I think as I was growing up, I would always, you know, being so in 
this Chinese culture that my family had created and also being a part of this Western Canadian culture, because I'm 43 now. So it, it, back when I grew up in North Vancouver, there weren't many Chinese people or um, BIPOC people at all in North Vancouver. I think that I was always like, but why? Why can't you just hug me? Why can't you just tell me you love me? You know, and and it, I definitely came to, to terms with that. I don't feel that anymore. But then when you record this show and you were filming it and and you realize this lesson on such a deeper level that, and I don't know if it's just talking to people about it or being forced to really sit down and think about it to the point where you can write an episode about it. It really solidifies just another la layer of importance that uh, that you kind of, that settles inside of you. And I don't think that that's the last level of realization that I'll have. I'll probably still, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now, if I'm lucky enough to be here, like I, I still think that I'll be understanding how my mom was loving me through food and how that trickles into how I love my child with food now, which is now that he's starting to eat solids is, both very stressful and lots of opportunities to love him so yeah I think uh just jumping here too I think another reason why we we I think Jackie really, really um was a good pick for host for the series too was because she, it was such an integral part of her life right she had just written this memoir in some respects closed the chapter to Boku and she's gonna have a kid now and you really I think Jack, I know you can speak on this too if you want, but like, you know, you really kind of relive your childhood, you know, when you have your kid. And we thought, yeah. wow, this is just such an integral part of just looking at back at food memories and 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 tying that all in this series too, right? And that's kind of how we, we kind of put the show with a bow at the end where we reveal that, you know, finally she has this kid at the very end. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was really good timing. That was really good timing. Mm -hmm. I planned all of that. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. We didn't know we were going to do the project. And then I just thought, <laughs> yeah. I was like, what's going to happen? Yeah. All right. I think the last question, and that will bring us right to three o'clock. Sure. Is, as we know, as filmmakers, there's always footage that doesn't make it into the episode. It goes literally on the chopping block. So it will does. they be compiled into something else with editor's commentary? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, as far as I know, likely not <laughs> i don't think so uh it's just time and, and resource right it's now. just time resources we're off to like the next yeah. the next thing um but that would be fun but uh yeah i don't think so i think the the round table was kind of we did a little 45 minute you know chat with uh our executive producer ken jackie myself and and uh danny with the co-director i think that was that was a way to do it um you know so that's more uh i guess bonus content but yeah, just kind of onward and upward to, to whatever's next. Well, I'm sure you'll continue to be invited to talks like this. We're happy Thank to, you. to bring you back, especially when our museum opens. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to check it out. I would love that. Well, on behalf of the Chinese Canadian Museum and everyone here, thanks so much for just spending an hour to talk about food and and life and <laughs> recipes. And before this officially started, Jackie and Ryan were talking a lot about parenting. So there could <laughs> yes. be a follow-up episode. <laughs> yeah, parenting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Parenting. That's a yeah. deep topic, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. God, Chinese that's a show. Canadian parenting. Right? Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Bust out the feather dusters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So an outpouring of gratitude. I hope you take some time to read the comments. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you thank so you much, everybody. Yeah, that was fun. And yeah. please do watch the rest of the series if you haven't. You just have to go to howspecialseries.com. Yes. Thank okay. you so much for thank inviting us. Thank you so us. much. That was a lot of fun. Great so questions like to it. everyone. That was great. Yeah. And yeah. happy new year. Happy, happy new, new year. year. Happy new yeah. year. There's still one yeah. more day. And then all, one the, more day. all the taboos get lifted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank God I can wash my hair again. <laughs> right. I know. I know. Get your haircut. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah.
Well, thanks, guys. Everyone. <laughs> okay, bye now. <laughs>